It's been a while since I've worn a white shirt. Still looks good though, right? Right? Anyway, welcome back, you delightful individuals. Welcome back to Thirst and Vanity, where we explore all of the realms of hedonism. Why? Because we can. It's the home of hedonism. Let's enjoy it, you know? Today, my dear chums, we're going to be looking at the seven deadly sins. Because, you know, in popular culture, in movies and media of all varieties, people talk about the seven deadly sins. It's always intrigued me as to how deadly the seven deadly sins actually are. After all, we know that a lot of uh, historical literature becomes extremely dated over time. So the question remains, how dated have the seven deadly sins become? First of all, I think we need to look into what are the seven deadly sins, because we can always do with a nice little refresher, and it also puts a nice bit of context into the video as to what we're actually going to be talking about. Now, to my understanding, before we dig deep into all of this stuff, the seven deadly sins have always been some description of indulgence. An indulgence that ye olde Dark Ages Christianity said was a bad thing. I mean, Christianity have said an awful lot of things are bad things, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have always been bad things. Now, as per usual, good and bad is surely a matter of perspective, but let's dig into it, shall we? What are the seven deadly sins? Starting in no specific order with gluttony. Gluttony, an indulgence in food. Wrath, an indulgence in anger. Envy, an indulgence in jealousy. Greed an indulgence in wealth and, suppose, possessions. Lust, an indulgence in sexual gratification. Sloth, an indulgence in rest, or potentially laziness. And finally, pride, an indulgence in your achievements. Or, at a wider scope, an indulgence in being proud of something even if that means where you were born. So those are them. Lots of indulgences going on there in a variety of different things. And immediately I can see some problematic behaviors coming out in each of them. But overall, I would say a certain amount of them is, is relatively healthy or certainly can be in the right perspective. But before we dig into it, let us look at where the actual sins came from. What was it? that the sins originated from? Who was it that turned around and said, these are particularly sinful? Because it wasn't Jesus. So, according to historians, the seven deadly sins reportedly originated as categories of evil thoughts known as the nine logismoi, which is spelt like this. The logismoi, the nine logismoi, and I genuinely hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, were condensed down into three categories. Categories that were considered to be thoughts that come to lead us away from Christ, with the idea that Christ is the perfect being, and therefore we should try and be like him. Those three categories were physical, emotional, and mental, and they fall into these categories as follows. Within the physical, the three categories are nutritive, sexual, and acquisitive appetites. So physical things that one can indulge in and want for. The emotional, depressive, fury, and dismissive feelings, all states of heightened emotion, presumably. And the mental, jealous or envious, proud and boastful states of mind. So jealous and envious are one, proud is another, and then boastful. So I haven't managed to find any definitive information as to where the nine logismoi originated in regards to like what era they originated, who it was that originally put them down, but I know that it was written in Greek originally, um, potentially by a, a philosopher or a, a Christian theologian perhaps. However, we do know in the 4th century AD, the monk Evagrius Ponticus, if I'm pronouncing that correct, condensed these nine logismoi into eight. These eight would condense down into gluttony, prostitution slash fornication, greed, sadness 
specifically sadness around the good fortune of somebody else, wrath, one called Acidia, which by modern interpretations is probably closely related to apathy or depression, boastfulness, and pride. Those were the eight condensed versions from our dear monk, and they were also written originally in Greek. They were then translated from the original Greek into Latin by what is to become the modern Catholic Church. Latin was seen as the chosen language of the Western Church, and there was some slight alterations in the translations, so it became gluttony, lust slash fornication, greed, sorrow slash despair, wrath, acidia again, uh, vain glory, and then pride. Naturally, when I read this, the concept of vain glory being a sin vexed me in my very soul. It was like they were purposefully targeting me. And that's how they were from the 4th century right up until 590 AD, so the 6th century AD. Wherein Pope Pius I, the original Pope Pius, the OG Pope Pius, translated the eight of these sins down to the seven sins that we know today, the seven deadly sins. Pope Pius condensed down sorrow, despair, and acedia into what we now know as sloth, and also condensed vainglory and pride into just pride. Then he went back to the OG logismoi, the nine, and uh, brought back envy for good measure. Little nod to the, uh, the original text, you know? And with this being a uh, Catholic Pope that decided all of this, uh, naturally the sentiment behind them has always remained the same. These are the things, the thoughts, the emotions, the feelings that will turn you from Christ. They will lead you away from Christ. With the understanding that according to the Catholic Church and a large variety of Christian dominations out there, Christ is who we should aim to be exactly like. Now, as somebody who is an avid studier of theology, I find the entire concept fascinating in regards to loving that people have faith but hating organized religion. I could go off on a complete tangent about how the vast majority of loud, proud Christians today are about as far from Christ-like as you can get. But I'm not gonna. That can be saved for another video, I'm sure. Getting back on point, though, now that we know the origins of the original seven deadly sins, let's look at each one, shall we, and decide for ourselves how sinful an act it really is. Now, Pope Pius I actually categorized these sins from least offensive to most offensive, least sinful to most sinful. And naturally, the further down the list you got, the more likely you were to end up in the fiery pits of hell. You know? So, in order of severity, our first sin is lust. The mildest of the sins, apparently. Now, lust is definitely one of the sins that I most identify with. Like, I am completely understanding of the Christian value of no sex before marriage, and whether you're religious or not, if that's what you choose to do. All power to you, friend. All right? I personally couldn't be with a person that I don't know whether I have any kind of sexual chemistry with. Before I commit to somebody for life, which is what marriage is supposed to be, before I commit to somebody for life, I need to know that we are going to be sexually compatible. And I know this because I have been with people before who we have not been sexually compatible. Very attracted to each other, just not sexually compatible. And that's okay. But I couldn't imagine getting with somebody for life and then finding out that we were sexually non-compatible. But even with this understanding of no sex before marriage, surely once you are married, unless you're part of the asexuality spectrum, you would want your partner to want to have sex with you. Like, even on the basest of levels, the entire human species does not continue without the rumpy, pumpy, bumping uglies. It doesn't continue without sex. And sex requires lust. Or obligation. 
and the latter of which is actually a much graver sin, in my personal opinion. You should always have sex because you want to have sex, not because you feel obliged to do it. I'm aware that there is a bigger conversation there around uh, people who feel obliged to have sex in order to try and procreate because they're trying for a baby. But that is another question, another topic of conversation that we can have some other time. All right, all right, all right, all right. There is, of course, as with all things, a darker side to lust. The point of which a person's lust transcends another person or creature's bodily autonomy. Like when lust encroaches beyond the point of consent, whether through active statements of no or lack of agreement to an act or wherein they can't consent to an act because they're not of age or they haven't got sound state of mind or they're unconscious or, of course, they're not human. You know, we're talking sexual assault, bestiality, necrophilia, paedophilia. This is where there is no redemption. <laughs> there is no redemption for a person that is putting their desire before all else and actively causing damage to others because of it. That is really where the sinful part of lust comes in. But lust as an inherent thing isn't sinful. <laughs> when consensual, wanting to want another consenting adult is not sinful. And wanting them to want you is not sinful. It's part of a very natural process of things. On to the next one, gluttony. One for the foodies out there. Or at the very least, gluttony is most associated with food in modern interpretations of it. Gluttony is known as the uh, indulgence in food and drink most often associated with fat people. From what I found in all of my research, it basically comes down to the 6th century of fat shaming. That or controlling peasants in making them happy about how little food they actually had by saying, well, at least you're not indulging in the sin of gluttony. And yet, all of the king's lords and nobles somehow were able to miss that sin entirely. But as... Everybody with a sense of taste can attest. You can enjoy food without health conditions. And I'm sure that everybody of a larger size can also attest that food is not the sole reason for a larger body. There are a variety of different health conditions that come wherein the body maintains and retains water and fat deposits and a whole load of different things that cause the body to be larger that have got nothing to do with food. For me personally, when I think about gluttony, the first thing that springs to my mind is comfort food. Pretty much everyone in this day and age has knowledge of a comfort food, something that you can eat that makes you feel good, whether it be nostalgic, whether it be cozy, whether it just be because you've had a hard day and this is a little treat for you. And that is what food is. For many people, it's a comfort. Whether it be something small, like relaxing after a long day. It's been a hard day, you just want to take a moment and have a little treat for yourself. Or whether it be something much larger, like an escape from trauma, depression, a number of other mental health conditions that people suffer from. Food can bring a huge comfort to people who are really struggling. And if it staves off misery for even the short amount of time, I would argue that it shouldn't be so easily condemned. So the dark side of this sin is, of course, health conditions. And to a lesser extent, uh, body image, body confidence, that kind of thing. There has always been an illusion with the idea that indulgence in food has to be unhealthy but especially in this day and age it is entirely possible to have a healthy balanced diet that also tastes really good <laughs> one of the big thing that a lot of these dieting industries build up is the idea of good food that is good for you good tasting food that is good for you 
And then, of course, talking about dieting, there is this whole self-destructive implication with stuff like cheat meals. The implication that in order to enjoy a food, it has to be cheating when it is entirely possible to have a completely open, healthy and balanced diet that tastes good. But the key there, of course, is balance. Our next seventh deadly sin, or the third deadly sin, so to speak, is greed. I was expecting this to come a little bit higher on the list, but apparently it isn't. It's number three on the list. Greed, an indulgence in material possessions and wealth. This one I actually struggle to justify because it's not a bad thing to want things. Seeing something you want, a luxurious something, isn't a bad thing. In fact, it can be quite the motivator to save for a holiday, for a specific item that will bring you pleasure, that you really enjoy within your vicinity. Uh, a console, a computer, a TV. Working hard, repairing a hobby vehicle because you desperately want to be the one to drive it around all over the place. These are things wherein short-term sacrifice comes about for things that we desire to have, that we desire to possess, that we desire to experience. And to want those things is greed. However, in this day and age of late-stage capitalism, we constantly see the flaunting of borderline unattainable wealth, especially within the world of content creation. Welcome to it. It's the primary difference between working hard to attain a thing, an experience, a possession, and effectively just having a because I can attitude. I got this Bugatti because I can. I'm on this cruise because I can. And that's really where it comes in. The difference between working hard because you want something, a material possession, an experience, and flaunting it because you can. We're at the midway point, my dear friends. And our midway point, the middle tier of sinful the feelings or acts or emotions is sloth psychologically sloth is a really interesting one because it's described in all of the literature as without care which kind of encompasses a state of sorrow disassociation as we know it today apathy laziness all of these things now i will always always have an issue with something being considered a sin when it is not a conscious choice by the sinner all of the previously mentioned can be seen as symptoms of the blight of a variety of mental health conditions, depression, or at the very least, depressive episodes being a primary example of that. There are even many therapists in today's day and age that are arguing that there is no such thing as laziness, and that it's simply demotivation that is caused by some other mental health situation. I kind of disagree with that as an entire concept because there's definitely parts of my own life where I've demonstrated a level of demotivation simply because I couldn't be bothered. An actual example of pure laziness. I can't be fucked to get up and do the washing up even though there are no clean plates in the house. That kind of thing. That being said, I do agree that there's a lot of more serious mental health conditions that have demotivational symptoms that are often passed off by folks that don't understand or more specifically refuse to try to understand as laziness. There is a huge difference between not doing a task because you can't be bothered and not doing a task because you are so demotivated that you can't even care for yourself. You can't bring yourself to do the thing that seems so simple. And many of you that are watching this will know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of you that don't are lucky. I am lucky. I am lucky that I have the luxury to be lazy and not be in a position 
where I am so demotivated, I can't even bring myself to do the simple thing. That being said, I do have to take a moment to add a personal pet peeve of mine. It is completely valid to be depressed, to be demotivated, to be struggling, and it's completely okay to reach out to alleviate the mental pressure to those that consent to listen. But do not, do not wantonly complain about life or seek advice on how to better your existence if you have no intention of changing. You have the right to indulge in whatever emotional state that you wish. That is entirely your right, entirely fair. I will never criticize that. But don't seek the help of other people if you're only going to find an excuse, a reason, some description of situation as to why it is that you can't ever choose to follow their advice. It's valid to be depressed. It's valid to be demotivated. It is valid to be struggling. It is not valid to seek advice and help when you have no intention of ever trying to help yourself. There's an age-old saying that says that people can't be helped unless they're prepared to help themselves, and I agree with that. You can't help somebody that isn't prepared to actually put the effort in to help themselves. We're past the halfway point, friends. We're doing it steadily but surely. Next, we have wrath. The indulgence in anger. This deadly sin is a fascinating one because in accordance with the catechism of the Catholic Church, anger itself isn't a sin. Anger is a neutral emotion that a person cannot control. So they accept the fact that anger is okay, but apparently in 6th century AD, anger was treated completely differently to depression. But, but, but anyway, the emotion of anger isn't the sin itself. It is the expression of anger when, and it's listed here, it is directed at an innocent person, unduly strong or long-lasting, or the anger desires an unjust or excessive punishment. And with this one, I actually kind of completely agree with it, if I'm completely honest with you. It's completely natural to feel anger. Anger is a natural emotion that human beings go through. Anger is an emotion that we human beings have no control over experiencing. However, we do have control in how that anger is expressed. And regardless of how furious we should become, that anger should always be measured with fairness in whom it is directed at, with no more tenacity than is warranted, no more punishment than is warranted. I would also add from a personal level that there should always be understanding. Understanding for both the reason why you get angry and whether there are any reasons for both the anger itself and the source that has caused the anger. Bearing in mind that reasons are not excuses. Knowing why will only ever help you understand your anger. Just because somebody has a reason for something does not mean they are due to be excused by it. Envy, oh, our penultimate sin. The phrase green with envy is an interesting one. Still not entirely sure where that comes from, but green with envy. For those people that might not know what envy means, it's basically jealousy in the modern tongue. Now, envy, in my personal opinion, may be one of the most toxic of the seven deadly sins. It destroys lives, not only of the envier, but also of the person that is envied. It destroys relationships, family, friends, familial bonds, workplace, and direct intimate relationships. It destroys all of these things. Even if it doesn't destroy the relationship itself, it destroys the person that is involved. Either the person that is envied upon or the envier, the person who experiences the envy themselves that gets so wrapped up in their jealousy of another person that it destroys their life. Naturally, you may assume that I just agree that envy is just a naturally, horrifically toxic sin. 
But on the other side of things, it can also be a fantastic motivator. See, with something like envy, it's about perspective and intent. It is okay to see appear someone that you admire, a loved one even, achieve things that you get jealous over. What's not okay is to let that fester. Seeing your peers doing well is not a bad thing. Allowing that emotion to turn into bitterness is where the sinful behavior really begins. Whereas, if you use that as an incentive to fuel yourself, fuel the betterment of yourself, that can actually be a really good and healthy thing to do. Within the world of content creation, I get jealous. I get envious of my friends, of other content creators around me. But I never, I will never ever be upset by them being successful. I'll be jealous that I don't have the same success. But I will use that as a way to spur on my motivation. I will use that as a way to see a target goal. So that I can be as successful, or if possible, more successful, than the people around me. Not that I don't want them to be successful, just that I want to push myself as far as I can possibly go. Turning envy into a fuel for ambition is absolutely fantastic. And finally, our ultimate sin, the worst of the worst, how vile it is that this should exist. Pride. Pride is actively described by the church as the most demonic, the anti-God sin and is thought to be the source of all of the previous six deadly sins. And the argument behind this is that it was pride that turned the angel Lucifer from God's grace, and therefore pride must be the worst sin. It was pride that birthed how the Christians currently perceive the devil, and therefore, pride must be the worst. And once again, I could go on a theological rant about how self-indulgently prideful the Christian God is portrayed to be throughout the Bible and how so many Christians indulge in this specific deadly sin in their preachings and condemnations. But this is an analytical video about the seven deadly sins and not Valen's theological soapbox. Now, I will personally say that my personal pride has helped me be the bigger person and not succumb to fickle bitterness and destructive behavior. Prideful thoughts of, I am better than this nasty behavior, and I will not stoop to that level, have actively got me through the, some of the worst periods in my life. And if we're being honest about it, that pride and self-belief born of that pride is the reason that I'm still breathing today. So naturally, I'm going to struggle with it being considered the worst sin of all. When you work hard on something, a job, your family, blood-related or not, or yourself, it is not a bad thing to take a moment and look over all you have achieved and feel proud. It is not a bad thing to celebrate your successes, to celebrate all you have achieved through your own hard work or lucky happenstance. It only really becomes a problem or problematic in nature when a person uses their achievements or circumstance to belittle the other people around them. It's like the difference between confidence and arrogance. Confidence is believing in your own capabilities, knowing that you are able to do something. Arrogance is rubbing it in people's faces. There we have it. The seven deadly sins, which in practice, in my humble opinion, aren't actually all that sinful. And you know, 
It's been 1500 years since the last translation and adaptation of the Seven Deadly Sins. So I think it's about time that we reevaluate them. Don't you? Let us start with lust, the mildest of the sins. And yet ones with, in my opinion, some of the direst consequences when turned dark. So I think lust should be recategorized as something like non-consent. Non-consent seems like a great sin. Doing something to someone else without their consent is a sin. Or doing something to someone who is not able to consent. Children, animals, the dead. Those are sins. That seems like something that we could validly consider sinful in behavior. Next, we had gluttony. I think we should broaden gluttony out to reasonless self-neglect. So get rid of the indulgence in food and see it as if you are neglecting yourself for no reason with the understanding that mental health is a reason, that should be considered sinful. You should look after yourself. You're a beautiful individual and you deserve to be treated like a beautiful individual. So reasonless self-neglect seems like a solid contender in replacement for gluttony. Next, we have greed. Now, greed's an interesting one because I think it should be refined down a little bit because I can see how it can be very bad. But it's not a bad thing to want. Th I know, I know, I know. We'll change greed into exploitative wealth. It is not a bad thing to want possessions and money. It is a bad thing to exploit others to gain it. Next, we have sloth. Now, I think sloth should be scrapped entirely. <laughs> As 95% of the time, there is a reason that a personal is in a demotivated state. However, we could, based off the back of um, what we said earlier, we could replace it with self-indulgent misery. It is a sin to be miserable when you're not prepared to do anything to change that misery. With the obvious exception of mental health conditions like depression, where the misery is not your fault. It's the self-indulgent misery, not the caused by other effects misery. Next, we have wrath. And I think wrath should just stay exactly as it is. The idea of anger not being a sin in and of itself, but the expression of that anger in an unjust way is the sin. That sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Envy. Envy is a hard one because it is inherently toxic. But it can also be an amazing motivator if directed correctly. Hmm. Envy could probably stay as it is, but with the caveat that it's targeted envy that is the sin. In fact, let's make it targeted envy. Targeted envy is the sin when you use that jealousy to target somebody in a malevolent way. And then pride. Pride... Pride, I feel like it should be more refined into arrogance. Arrogance in how it puts other people down due to your fortunate circumstances, I feel is more appropriate as sinful behavior. Not the having the fortunate circumstances, not the good things that happen to you, not the hard work, but the rubbing it in people's faces and belittling others because of your fortune. That is the sin in and of itself. And now let us uh, put them in order. From least sinful to most sinful, in my personal opinion. Least we have reasonless self-neglect. If you are neglecting yourself for no real good reason, you just can't be bothered. Laziness, not due to mental health, that seems uh, pretty mild to me, to be quite honest with you. Self-indulgent misery comes next because that can have quite an effect on yourself and the people around you. And especially if you have the power to change your life, but you don't want to. Then we have arrogance. Arrogance, the rubbing it in people's faces, because it can be very annoying. It can be quite destructive, but at the same time, it, it can also be quite harmless. Annoying, frustrating but harmless. Middle of the road, we have wrath in all of its glory of unjust anger. Then I feel like targeted envy 
would be next because that can be really quite toxic and destructive and uh, problematic. Then next, the penultimate sin, exploitative wealth. Gaining wealth through exploitation. And then finally, the worst, the most heinous sin, in my personal opinion, is breaches of consent. Non-consent. When you are literally doing something to another person without their consent. Or if they are a person or creature that cannot give consent. That is the most heinous of all sins. And I have said that for many, 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 many years. So there we have it. Our wonderful new seven deadly sins. What do you think, friends? How do you feel about our new seven deadly sins? I would love to uh, know if you have any thoughts or comments about how we should rearrange them, ways that you think we should do them, or things that you completely disagree with. Um, put them down in the comments because I'm always game for a cheeky little bit of feedback. And of course, friends, if you've got to this point in the uh, in the video, I would love it if you click that cheeky little thumbs up because it really helps with the algorithm. And uh, it also gives me the sign that you are genuinely enjoying the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. And of course, if you haven't already, I would love it if you could press that cheeky little subscribe button. Doesn't cost you a thing, but it always helps me out, you know? And there we have it, friends. The seven deadly sins. Or the new age. Seven deadly sins, you know? I will see you all next week. And remember, friends, until then, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Because if I wouldn't do it, I'll fucking kill you. I'll see you later. Bye-bye-bye.